All right, well, I thought it'd be a good idea to set the stage for Wenjin's talk by um, talking a little bit about the role of the dollar in the US and the international financial system. And I wanted to uh, sort of start by uh, showing you this picture from a recent report out of the BIS on dollar funding markets. Um, what this picture shows is the international role of the dollar. The red bars show the role of, of the US in terms of uh, as a fraction of world trade and as a fraction of global GDP. And then the gray bars show the importance of the dollar uh, as a share of the global market, uh, both in terms of cross-border loans, international debt, volume of FX transactions, official reserves, trade invoicing, and swift payments. And what you, what you sort of see is that the dollar plays an extremely important role that is disproportionate even to the size of the US economy. That's what you get from comparing the gray bars. Uh, to the red bars. And this manifests itself, this role of the dollar in, in various ways. But one key uh, aspect of this is that um, it sort of um, creates this unique opportunity um, uh, for the US to manufacture dollar safe assets because foreign investors seem to derive uh, convenience yields from their holdings of dollar safe assets, in particular treasuries. Right? Um, and there's a lot of recent work um, that, that sort of starts from this team, and this draws on earlier work by uh, Arvind Krishnamurthy and Annette Fissing Jorgensen, uh, Francis Longstaff, um, and Bondal and Coleman, and others. Um, there's also some evidence that the dollar exchange rate actually prices in these convenience yields. So, for example, in bad times when there's more demand for dollar safe assets, the dollar appreciates. Okay. Um, the Treasury is not the only one who um, manufactures safe assets in the US. In some sense, the US financial system is also in the business of trying to create substitutes for treasuries and catering to this demand. These are not perfect substitutes, obviously. Uh, so for example, before the great financial crisis, banks were uh, heavily involved in, in the growth of, of MBS. And you could think about this as sort of catering to the safe asset demand on the part of foreign investors. But more recently, non-banks have become involved in this. And you see this, for example, in the growth in the leverage loans market. Leverage loans market, excuse me. US actually, as a result of this, earns a considerable amount of senior rich revenue from the creation of dollar safe assets. Okay? And, and then it goes on to invest this in risky foreign assets. So you get this sort of interesting dynamic where even though the US is a low interest rate currency country, and the dollar is a low interest rate currency, the US manages to run large and persistent current account deficits. Foreigners also uh, wanna borrow in dollars because borrowing in dollars is cheap. And this is, this is an important point to realize, there's dollar debt dominance in, in global financial markets. There's some recent work by Majora, Neiman and Schrieger that shows that foreign investors really only wanna hold, hold dollar debt if they're gonna hold debt that's not denominated in their own currency. Importantly, this gives rise to this sort of desire to issue debt in dollars because it's cheap. It's cheap gives rise to currency mismatch on the balance sheet of lots of foreign investors around the world, okay? uh, especially in emerging markets. So you could sort of, to summarize, think about um, the US Treasury as issuing these safe IOUs um, and the US financial sector um, doing the same thing. Um, this is sort of part of what people refer to as exorbitant privilege. But on the other hand, there are also these foreign countries, state Brazil, for example, where, for example, non-financials would be tempted to borrow in dollars um, because it's cheap. Uh, but then, of, kind of, of course, it could be that they end up with currency mismatch on their balance sheet. And it's important to keep in mind that the dollar will tend to appreciate in bad times. So this, this potentially sort of a, a, uh, a non-appealing feature of this whole this whole arrangement. Okay. Why did I spend time on this? Well, because occasionally then what you could get is sort of these acute dollar funding shortages. And, and the way these manifest themselves is in, in covered interest rate parity deviations. And these are going to feature prominently in Wenjin stock. So if you look at the dollar basis, which is the cash dollar interest rate minus the synthetic dollar interest rate. Uh, then regardless of the specifics of how you measure this object, it's sort of consistently been negative for the dollar against other G10 currencies since the great financial crisis. And there's kind of two ways to interpret this. One is 
foreign investors are willing to accept much lower uh, returns because they earn a convenience yield on cash dollar instruments, US dollar instruments. On the other hand, this also means that foreign borrowers um, experience a dollar funding shortage. Think of that Brazilian firm that was borrowing dollars, COVID hits, all of a sudden it doesn't have the same export revenue in dollars and it can't tap US money markets, so it's forced to borrow at a higher synthetic dollar dollar interest rate. That's sort of uh, what you have in mind. And if you look at that picture, uh, that's the three month treasury basis. And it's, it's sort of been negative. And um, since the great financial crisis and occasionally it widens uh, quite a bit, okay. Um, so that's kind of the symptom of these dollar uh, shortages. So let me now uh, finish on, on this slide. And I think this will set the stage nicely for Wenjin stock. Um, what Wenjin is going to focus on is the role of, of big U.S. banks in sort of intermediating these occasional global dollar shortages. And what she's going to show is that basically what these banks will do is sort of funnel dollars from their excess reserve holdings at the Fed to these deficit countries. Um, occasionally, of course, and maybe we can talk about that later, the Fed will also directly step in and provide uh, FX swap lines itself. Um, let me stop right here uh, and unshare my screen um, to uh, allow Wenjin um, to take over and, and um, give her presentation. All right, everybody sees my screen okay? Great. Yes. So thank you so much, Hanno, for the wonderful introduction. And thank you all for joining me today to discuss US banks and global liquidity. This is joint work with Ricardo Correa and Gordon Liao, both at the Federal Reserve Board. Uh, so the usual Fed disclaimer applies, uh, all the views are our own. So just to first follow up upon Hanno's discussion at this point, I think we know there has to be some friction in the intermediation of global dollar funding. That's why we get frequent spikes, for instance, in the dollar repo rates. That's why we get a persistent failure of the textbook no arbitrage, the cover interest rate parity relation. In this paper, we zoom in the role of large global banks, in particular large US banks, just to see how exactly they intermediate dollar funding through these episodes of dollar funding shortage. And the key result is we argue that the reserve-based intermediation has become dominant post-global financial crisis. What this means is that from, for instance, US banks perspective, on days with large dollar funding shortage, the banks does decide to increase its dollar lending because it's very profitable on those difficult days. But how is that additional lending financed? A reserve-based intermediation suggests that extra lending is financed via reducing uh, the bank's extra cash uh, in the form of excess reserves at the Federal Reserve, as opposed to from borrowing from additional uh, cash-rich lenders in the economy. And that distinction is important because it really highlights the important role of maintaining an ample amount of reserve for the whole system uh, in a sense it would really help facilitate the plumbing of global financial markets uh, in, the in, the, in the case of dollar funding. And uh, furthermore, we highlight that the well-functioning of this reserve-based dollar intermediation crucially depends on the connection between the traditional banks, these deposit institutions that hold reserves and the shadow banks uh, or the broker dealers that actually do most of these repo and FX swap market based dollar lending. Uh, so in particular, we're gonna show you evidence that the intro form transfer within the same holding company between the commercial bank arm of the uh, company and the broker dealer arm of the same bank holding company is very sizable and important uh, for this type of dollar uh, intermediation. So uh, in terms of the empirical execution, we're gonna be focusing on three types of dollar funding shortages. The first is uh, we look through the lens of US banks uh, thinking about their potential response on quarter end days. Why is quarter end particularly different? It's particularly different is in most non-US jurisdictions, uh, banks um, are subject to the Basel III leverage ratio requirement and these leverage ratio requirements are uh, uh, calculated based on the quarter end snapshot of their non-US banks balance sheets. So therefore, on quarter end days, uh, non-US banks significantly reduce their dollar intermediation. 
for U.S. banks, their leverage ratio is based on the daily average of their balance sheets. Uh, so therefore, it is interesting to see whether and how U.S. banks intermediate the dollar funding out of these uh, dollar funding shortage days, particularly on quarter ends. The second type of shortage is we look at days with large increases in the Treasury General Account balance. Um, so what TGA account is, um, this is the US Treasury's checking account at the Federal Reserve. An increase in the TGA account, other things being equal, corresponds to a reduction in the cash for the overall banking sector. Um, so therefore, that also naturally leads to more tighter, uh, tighter funding conditions. And thirdly, uh, we will also discuss a bit about the days that the Federal Reserve reduces its portfolio holdings uh, through the balance sheet tapering uh, that was uh, occurring between uh, 2018 and uh, I think 2017 all the way to 2019. Okay. So, um, so in response to these three types of dollar shortages, what we find empirically is that these large U.S. banks do increase their additional uh, liquidity provision uh, by lending specifically, uh, which is the focus of our paper, in these short-term uh, dollar lending markets, in particular in the repo market, uh, which will show up as an increase in the reverse repo position on these large banks' balance sheet. And also the global uh, aspect of this is they also increase their lending in the FX swap markets okay so the ingredients that allow us to do this uh, somewhat detective or forensic work is this new data collection effort the FR 2052a which is the regulatory filings for the Basel 3 leverage ratio uh, sorry leverage uh, liquidity coverage ratio and the nice aspect of this data is that it gives us a detailed daily snapshot of individual banks asset inflows and liability outflows by currency on a consolidated basis, as well as by material subsidiaries. Um, so this allows us to manually map these inflows and outflows into our usual more familiar looking asset and liability items uh, for the bank holding companies and also for important subsidiaries of interests. The main sample period uh, began in December 2015. That's when the daily collection of this form began. And, uh, for most part of the analysis, we're going to be doing analysis right before the last September's repo market spike. Uh, but more recently, we also extended the sample to um, cover uh, May uh, all the way to May 2020, so that if time allows, we can also have a bit of discussion about dollar funding crunch during the uh, COVID period. Small sample, but very, very important sample. We only cover six banks for this paper, Bank of America, City, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, and Wells Fargo. These are so-called the GSIPs, so it stands for Globally Systematically Important Bank uh, in, in the US. Okay. When did, can I ask you a quick question about that? So why, why did you decide to focus just on these six? Is that a data issue? Yeah, so there are eight, there are only eight GSIPs um, uh, in the US, so GSIPs are required to file this daily reporting, others are not. Uh, the other two are uh, running very important custodian business. Um, so Wells, uh, Bank of New York Mellon and State Street. So they run very different business model. So therefore we decided to focus on the six instead of all eight. Uh, but adding those two is not gonna change the picture too much. Okay, thanks. All right, so um, as a background, I want to spend one minute to discuss, the, uh, to discuss the evolution of the Fed balance sheet in our main sample period. As you can see, this is the daily sample starting time, and this is the September repo spike last year. On the next day, uh, the Fed reestablished the repo facility. So if you look at this period, which is our main sample period for this paper, uh, what you see is on the asset side for the Federal Reserve, you have this light blue area, that's Fed holdings of treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. And how is it financed? It's through the liability items here. The key object of interest is this red area, that's reserve balances for the entire banking sector, right? So this is the bank's money at the Federal Reserve. Um, so as the Fed reduces its overall portfolio holdings uh, through this balance sheet normalization process, uh, the reserve balances was declining. Okay, the reserve balances was declining also for another reason. So despite the progress we have made in digitization, there's been a steady demand for currency in circulation. Uh, so, so the end results of both Fed tapering and the steady growth of currency demand is that the reserve hit their multi-year low uh, since the post, uh, since we launched QE, um, since the GFC, okay? So that's an important object. Um, that's the key for the reserve-based intermediation. 
Another thing that's also going to be important for the second type of TGA shock is precisely the TGA balance, which is showing purple here. So that's Treasury, US Treasury's money at the Fed. And increasing the purple is going to translate to a reduction in red, other things being equal. Uh, so that's why it shows up here uh, as an important factor that also reduces reserve balance. All right. So uh, to first show you some data before we go into the specific empirical analysis. Uh, so this shows you USD denominated balance sheet for the aggregate six banks in our sample. All right, so everything's in dollars. Assets are plotted in the positive territory, liabilities are plotted in the negative territories. So what you see is for USD denominated balance sheets uh, for these six large banks, you still have the traditional like risky like or more illiquid loans on the asset side and deposits on the liability side being the largest item. But the stuff that we are gonna be focusing on today are sizable. So what are the stuff that we are focusing on today? These are the short term, highly scalable liquid version of the balance sheet. So we have reverse repos backed by largely matched by repo position. We also have cash and reserve balances and treasury securities. Um, so this liquid portion of the balance sheet is around two, two, two trillion dollars uh, for the six of our sample banks combined. Um, and why is it important to focus on this item? These items are different because banks can change these items proactively at a very high frequency, say daily basis or even intraday basis. Whereas for deposit, it's more passive and for loan, it takes longer to originate. So those are the other items, the blue ish, sorry, the green ish areas are not, banks are not gonna be able to change them at a pretty high frequency. So the picture is actually quite different if we were to look at foreign currency development balance sheets. On this slide, you see Euro, Yen, uh, Jap uh, Jap uh, Euro, Yen, British Pound, and Australian Dollar denominated balance sheet, respectively. You see that those uh, green areas have disappeared largely. Uh, so instead, the short-term scalable version of the balance sheet, the repos, the reverse repos, uh, the cash, uh, the treasuries, they play a much more important role for foreign currency denominated balance sheet for US banks. And in our view, a large part of it is also to facilitate dollar lending globally uh, in the FX swap market. Okay, so to fix terminology, uh, we're going to be zooming two types of dollar lending, um, very short term. The first one is dollar lending in a repo market. Uh, so thinking about a large U.S. bank, J.P. Morgan wants to lend dollars in the repo market. So J.P. Morgan is giving out cash at the inception of the trade and the borrower returns the cash at the maturity of the trade. It's a collateralized lending in a sense JP Morgan lends against some collateral, typically US Treasury securities. And if the lender, re if the borrower repays, the JP Morgan is also going to return the collateral. So this one is straightforward to measure because it literally shows up as the reverse repo positions on the bank's balance sheet. So that's the first one. The second one is slightly different, uh, slightly more different, uh, but the idea is similar in the sense we want to discuss how does dollar lending in the FX swap market work. In this case, we also argue it's a type of collateralized lending, except the collateral is not US Treasury, it is foreign currency. Um, so take an example of lending dollar in the dollar yen swap market, uh, Japanese. Um, so this JP Morgan US banks lends at dollars um, to some borrower, uh, which could be based in Japan or elsewhere, not directly, but through an FX swap market dealer. Um, and uh, in exchange, in terms of collateral, uh, the USD borrower basically gives uh, JP Morgan uh, Japanese yen, again, through this FX swap market dealer. Uh, so what does JP Morgan do with this yen? Um, if you think about this as part of their market making business in FX swap, um, it's gonna try to avoid credit risk by either park that Japanese yen at Bank of Japan's deposit facility, earning the interest on excess reserves at BOJ, despite the fact that this rate is negative paid by Bank of Japan, as we will see on the uh, FX swap basis, uh, that negative rate actually translates into a more attractive rate compared to the interest on reserves paid by the Fed. Or uh, JP Morgan can decide to park that yen uh, in terms of a reverse repo positions backed by the Japanese government bond. So essentially lending out that yen in a repo market in Japan also to avoid credit risk, okay? And at maturity of this trade, uh, all the cash flows reverses. Um, 
and basically USD borrow returns the dollar cash to JP Morgan uh, because it, this Japanese yen on lending didn't involve any credit risk, it's going to get back that yen with certainty and basically return that uh, to the USD borrower. So the empirical challenge to measure uh, the extent of this type of activity is the FX swap transactions are off balance sheets, so are unobserved. However, uh, this activity does leave an unbalanced sheet footprint. So our uh, solution uh, to overcome this challenge is to infer how much FX swap market lending there is uh, by summing up um, how much the banks have in terms of foreign currency access reserve balances, either at the BOJ or at the ECB, uh, plus how much uh, net repo lending um, that these banks are doing in foreign currency. Uh, we also have a robustness measure discussed in the paper, literally trying to take the gap between foreign currency assets and foreign currency liability as how much overall dollar lending there is that the US banks are doing in the FX swap markets uh, based on the assumption that these large banks are fully hedged or close to being fully hedged on their currency positions on balance sheets. Otherwise, there's going to be a huge regulatory penalty for that, for running any FX mismatch. Okay, and we find very similar results using that alternative measure. So just to give you an idea of how big this type of short-term dollar lending we're talking about. Um, so it's about $1.2 trillion on average of lending in the repo market and between 300 to 400 billion uh, lending in the FX swap markets. Uh, so the red line here plots the overall amount of reserve uh, in the system. You can think about those as cash that may or may not be freely deployable uh, from bank's liquidity provision perspective. All right. The next question I want to discuss is how is this much of dollar lending financed? Uh, so this is a time to introduce two types of intermediation methods uh, that you can see from this uh, diagram here. So the baseline is let's only focus on a scalable component, a scalable component of bank balance sheets. So on the asset, we have repo lending or the FX swap lending. I lumped them into the same category here. And then we have some extra cash. So here it's not all reserve, but only the drainable part of the reserve. Uh, so meaning that this reserve is like truly extra that banks can use to support lending if it wants to. And on liability side, we have repos and we have some deposits. So the traditional way of intermediation that we might be more familiar with is the so-called matchbook intermediation. Say on days when the repo rate is 10 percentage point, the banks discover this is a very attractive opportunity to increase my repo lending. How should I do so? I am going to borrow additional dollars in the repo market and in order to lend additionally, either in the repo or the FX swap markets. So the result of this matchbook intermediation is that now banks expand the size of its overall balance sheet, right? By the same amount of its additional dollar lending. So that's the more familiar one. The new one that we're introducing to this paper is the third thing called reserve draining intermediation here. So under the reserve draining intermediation, we have an expansion of the short-term dollar lending at the expense of lowering amount of reserve balances. So if you compare the size of the bank's balance sheet after the more reserve draining intermediation, it stays constant compared to panel A, right? The size of the blue is the same, but the overall size of the blue plus the red is constant, um, constant compared to panel A. So what's the advantage of running a reserve-based um, intermediation compared to the matchbook intermediation? We can imagine if these large global banks are constrained in terms of their overall leverage, um, they might be more in favor of keeping the overall size of their balance sheet constant, uh, especially, for instance, on these quarter end reporting days. Um, and so that's an important consideration for leverage constrained banks. Um, and furthermore, uh, these large global banks are also particularly sensitive uh, to the GSIP capital surcharge, uh, which are also calculated while taking the size of a balance sheet as an important input. Okay. So having said that, it sounds like this reserve-based uh, intermediation is pretty neutral to the Basel III leverage ratios. Uh, it's not completely neutral uh, to regulation and self-imposed risk management constraints. Uh, 
why in order to understand that i think one key insight is really to figure out how it actually works in practice um, so who holds reserves it's only depository institutions are allowed to hold reserves so here i'm breaking down a bank holding companies into two arms the depository institutions on the left and the broker dealers on the right so only bis or the depository institution can hold this right amount of reserves but they're not the ones who are doing most of the repo and the FX swap lending. Uh, so those are the broker dealers that are doing most of these short term dollar liquidity provision. So therefore, in order to enable this reserve drain based intermediation, we have to have some intro firm flows within the same bank holding company. So what ended up happening that I'll show empirical evidence for is that on these difficult days, the DIs reduce their reserve balance and use that extra cash to lend to the BDs or the broker dealers within the same bank holding companies and the BDs use those extra cash uh, in order to support additional dollar lending. And that extra cash is oftentimes is almost always booked in the form of a repo position internally within the bank. Okay, so this is where you can imagine any frictions, either regulatory or self imposed constraints, in terms of how much intro firm transfer there can be, uh, is going to be a huge factor that determines the extent of this type of reserve based intermediation. All right. So pretty much said about this, so two types of intermediation are facing different types of um, regulatory and self-imposed constraints. Um, and Jen, could, yes. could I ask you a question here? So the, it seems like the, the Fed also plays an important role there in, in, because it sort of determines um, the, the total volume of reserves that these banks are, are sitting on. Right? Yeah, could absolutely. you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I talked about the extent that limit the intro firm flow, but of course you have to start with something to begin with, right? So this is already labeled as drainable reserve. So if the drainable amount of the reserve is very close to zero, then obviously even this intro firm flow is frictionless. We're not gonna be able to get much out of this. Uh, so you sort of need to have sufficient level of drainable reserves, and then you have enough willingness uh, to, to transfer them within the firms, okay? All right, so why are banks doing this? This sounds complicated, right? They're doing this because there is a positive fee to be earned for doing that activity, and those are the intermediation spread that we can measure. So how big are these intermediation spreads? On average, I would say in the repo market, we're talking about maybe 10 basis points on average outside big spikes on period ends. Uh, and in the FX swap markets, it's, it's, it's larger, uh, about maybe 20 basis points on average, and on quarter end, they can go up to 100 or 200 basis points. Uh, so more specifically, I'm showing you three spreads here. Um, the GCF minus tri-party repo spread is a proxy for the intermediation fee that banks can earn by doing a match book repo intermediation. Why? Because GCF, you can think about as a higher repo rate that's showing banks, large banks lending rate to smaller banks. And the tri-party repo rate, you can think about as the large banks borrowing rate in repo market, because that's a different market where large banks borrow from US money market funds at more favorable rate. So therefore the gap measures the match book intermediation fee or profit. Uh, the second one, the GCF minus IOR spread, gives us a sense about how much money banks can earn by doing the reserve-based intermediation in the repo market. Why, again, this is bank's lending rate, and this is the foregone opportunity cost or a foregone interest that banks would have earned if it left its money at the Fed earning the interest on reserve rate. Okay, so for FX uh, swap market lending, say the reserve based FX swap market lending, we're essentially just comparing the difference between a swapped BOJ or ECB deposit uh, into US dollars on an overnight basis with the overnight interest rate on reserve paid by the Fed. And that difference in our sample throughout is positive. And again, spikes you can see on these period end days that we're labeling with the dashed lines. All right. So now it's time to talk about quantities. Um, so we don't need further motivation. We know that quarter end days are particularly bad in terms of dollar funding condition. Uh, so what do US banks do exactly to get through these quarter end days? Um, 
So let's focus on the right hand side, those two panels first, because those are showing lending positions. So what we see is that very different from foreign banks behavior. So foreign banks significantly contract their repo lending. We have appendix slides on that. Um, using some limited data, not as comprehensive as our coverage for US banks, but I think we have pretty solid evidence that foreign banks contract significantly in terms of their reverse repo lending. US banks do not contract. They maintain their repo lending positions throughout quarter end. On top of that, they increase their FX swap market based dollar lending on quarter end, roughly about 200 billion. Okay, sorry, 20 billion, not 200, that's too much, 20 billion. Um, the next question is, how is that additional 20 billion or a steady amount of repo lending uh, actually financed? Here, it's pretty clear it's not coming from additional borrowing. If anything, the repo borrowing by our US GSIP actually declined significantly, about 25 billion on quarter ends. Um, it's entirely financed out of draining reserves. So reserve balances decline about 50 billion, which is enough to match the loss of repo funding. And in the meanwhile, uh, maintaining the repo lending and increasing the FX swap lending. Okay, so that's the key. That's the key here. And as Anjali, happened, can I yes, can I interject here? So, so I have a question about the, the sort of the quarter end uh, phenomenon. We had a uh, PhD student. At uh, Stanford, uh, Jonathan Wallen, whose work you may have seen, who is sort of arguing that what happens around these quarter end um, periods, uh, to some extent, uh, is that the uh, U.S. Uh, GSIPs face less competition from from their foreign counterparts, and and in some cases may be exploiting their their market power. Do you, are your are your results consistent with that? I, I don't speak directly to whether this is perfect competition or market power, but I think I'm sympathetic with that view. I think one can argue maybe they have space to do more, but otherwise, right. but if they do more, the price will be less favorable. Uh, so I think it's, it's consistent with that notion the U.S. banks are proactive, right, on those days that foreign banks are, are scaling back. Uh, so they are indeed more active than foreign banks. I can imagine their market share picked up. Um, so in that sense, it's consistent. Um, so going back to this, um, so as promised, uh, this is a slide to show you evidence for intro firm transfer uh, between the deposit institution and the broker dealers. So what we see here is broker dealers external repo borrowing uh, on these quarter end days contract significantly. But we showed you, right, their, their repo lending is constant and their FX swap lending is actually increasing. So how is that possible? It is possible because while reducing their external repo financing, they increase their net internal repo borrowing from the affiliated commercial banks within the same holding company. Um, so this intro firm transfer essentially allows them uh, to be able to keep their dollar liquidity provision and also to slightly expand it uh, in the FX swap market. And this is another time to discuss, you can imagine any constraint that uh, banks may face uh, in terms of intro firm liquidity sharing could act as a friction uh, to this type of uh, dollar intermediation. And more specifically, if you just want to think about one piece of regulatory constraint or consideration, um, so we're putting down the resolution planning rule as a potential important factor to consider. As under these rules, uh, banks are required to maintain sufficient amount of liquidity uh, at material subsidiaries, uh, not just calculated at bank holding company level, but also it's important to think about the allocation of liquidities across different subsidiaries. Right, so that's the first shock. Um, now I'm moving on to the second, I, maybe shock is not a good word. I'm moving on to the second type of dollar funding shortage because a lot of these fluctuations are actually anticipated ex ante. Bef before we uh, go into that, could you tell us yeah. a little bit about how much the market knows about these TGA fluctuations? Is, 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 are these predictable or are these totally obscure? Yeah, um, so so I would say, um, so the TGA, as we discussed, right, that they're the checking account for the U.S. Treasury at the Federal Reserve. I would say pretty much the, 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 the portion of the fluctuation that is attributed to the Treasury issuance and redemptions, 
those are pretty well anticipated because the auction actually happened before the TGA account actually incurred a change. Um, but for some other items, for instance, tax payments and expenditures, I think people may have a sense, right? People know like on these big tax days, there will be a big increase due to tax payment, but we don't know exactly how much. Uh, so there's going to be some uncertainty and there could be some other more unanticipated uh, spending uh, that's not fully anticipated. So I would say there is a forecastable component, but there is also a, a surprise component. Um, so if we ignore that, but by literally just looking at the daily fluctuation in the TGA balance, which is being plotted here on the x-axis, uh, we see that it's very highly correlated with the change, the daily change in the repo spread. Uh, so the repo spread we're plotting here, we're plotting one of the most important repo rate. This is the index, the, the secured overnight financing rate uh, that is in the process to being uh, the, the benchmark reforms target, reforms target to replace LIBOR. Uh, if not already, there will be a trillions of contracts that are indexed to so far. So it's a very, very important short-term money market rate. And the so far over the interest rate on reserves paid by the Fed, the spread is significantly increasing uh, with TGA balance. Um, so we have the last September's repo spike, right? This was the September 16 that we will discuss towards the end of this talk. Um, so it was a large TGA day. TGA increased by 83 billion on that day. Uh, the next day, that's where uh, we have some non-linearity kicked in. So the next day, this red line is actually off the chart that we're not plotting. Um, so overall, by seeing this chart, I think we're pretty comfortable to say that uh, days with large TGAs are days with uh, difficult dollar funding conditions. All right. So how do, again, from balance sheet or quality perspective, how do large US banks intermediate uh, on those large TGA days? Um, so running daily regression here of important uh, balance sheet variables of interest on the daily fluctuation in the TGA balance. Uh, the takeaway from this regression is that the quarter end message is still here. Um, so why do I say that? If you look at the lending items, so the reverse repo position, it actually contracts slightly, but, but I would say it's not a huge amount. So it's largely steady. Um, there is a significant increase in the FX swap lending, okay? And how is this financed? Not by additional borrowing. If anything, repo contracted, repo borrowing contracted significantly. So the overall net reverse repo lending increased significantly, okay? So everything in terms of being able to deploy additional uh, resources to support additional lending on large TGA days, everything is coming from uh, reducing reserve balances, okay? So this is in the sense the quarter end results and the TGA results are very consistent with, with each other. There is modest expansion of liquidity provision on these difficult days, largely in the FX swap markets, and it's being financed not by additional repo borrowing, but by reducing reserve balances at the Fed. All right. So everything I have said so far is about US GCIFs, or in particular, just six US banks. Um, if you think about the reserves as a whole, right, that's determined by the Federal Reserve's monetary policy interacting with, for instance, the demand for currency in circulation. Uh, so this is a time to also comment on the distributional issue of reserves, right? So we have said everything about this blue line, which is the US, six US GCIFs reserve balances. On this figure, uh, we're also plotting uh, the smaller domestic banks. So these are the smaller US banks reserves and also uh, the foreign banks reserves, all right, uh, which is the green lines. Uh, so what are these foreign banks and how hold reserve at the Fed? Uh, these are typically the large, the large non-US banks with US branches and subsidiaries that can not hold reserves. So all the big names that you imagine, they also have a reserve account at the Fed. So what we see here is that during a period of balance sheet normalization, uh, the smaller domestic banks reserve balances uh, were pretty stable. Uh, but uh, the US GCIFs, so the large US banks and the foreign banks, again, only large banks hold reserve balances at the US, um, in the US. Uh, so these two groups have significantly reduced their reserve balances. Um, 
So that's the background. Uh, we don't have as granular data, uh, if any data, pretty much at this level on foreign banks. But one thing that we do have is we have the daily reserve balances for foreign banks. So what we do in this next table is we run the similar request. Jin, before you go into that, can I ask you one yeah. more question about this? So for, if you take sort of a broader historical perspective, yeah. this is still a pretty big number, right? These, these reserves numbers. So it, even though you, you do see these sort of um, downward trends in this, in this short time picture, if you sort of would have a, a, a take a much broader historical view, that, then these are still very large numbers. So maybe, maybe you'll talk about this later, but, but w why is it that we seem to need uh, a, a bigger number for reserves in order to keep the market functioning well now? Yeah, very, very good question. Yeah, so as Connell correctly pointed out, yes, everybody's reserves was trending down to their multi-year low. But if you add up these three numbers here, right, we're still talking about $1.4 trillion of reserves, right? And uh, is that possible? Is it possible to say the drainable of a reserve is close to zero while having $1.4 trillion of close to being access reserved in the system? I think uh, a lot of things have changed. So my short answer to that is yes, it's actually quite plausible. And maybe that's the reason why we missed it last year, right? Because people thought it was not plausible. People thought 1.4 trillion was a large number. Uh, it is possible because many things have changed in terms of on the regulatory front, in terms of demand for reserves. Um, one thing we didn't discuss much today, uh, even though this form is designed for it, is the liquidity coverage ratio, right? Uh, so reserves are no longer excess because they are level one high quality liquid assets and banks have the intrinsic demand for reserve to satisfy uh, their, their LCR requirement, for instance. Um, and these resolution planning rules that we talked about also limit uh, the extent of freely de the deployable amount of reserves uh, because those commercial banks um, might actually have a significant amount of liquidity needs for resolution purpose um, to, to actually hoard those amount of liquidity in those entities in the US instead of freely deploy it to the rest of the world. Um, so that's my take. I think it's still possible, even though it's, it's gonna be challenging to quantify that unless we're willing to believe, okay. yeah, the 10% shock was indeed because the reserve was close to zero being trainable. All right, so, that was a good discussion. Um, now let's go back to this distributional issue. Uh, so if we run the same regression, so you pretty much have already seen the, the message of this regression for US GSIPs. So we're running daily changing reserve balances on these quarter end and quarter stock dummies, uh, daily change in TGA balance. I didn't discuss much about the SOMA. So this is the Fed portfolio holding. You can think about it as negative of the TGA balance. Um, so what you have is reserve for USG SIPs decline significantly on quarter end, increases after quarter ends, uh, declines with respect to TGA and increase with respect to Fed portfolio holding. You actually find very qualitatively consistent message for large foreign banks as well, uh, which suggests, I think we're not ruling out this complete plausible, even though we don't have direct evidence on their other part of other parts of their balance sheet. I think it's quite plausible that the reserve based method is also an important method for foreign banks in intermediating dollar funding. Um, and uh, so who, what else? Uh, so basically the domestic banks and other people's cash. So non banks cash at the Federal Reserve they owe in the overnight reverse repo facility turned out to be soaking all the slacks. So on quarter ends, US banks and foreign banks reduce their reserve balances. Smaller domestic banks and other people basically pile that extra stuff um, at the Fed. Uh, so as a result, you think about on days with difficult dollar funding condition, it's the large players in the system, these GSIPs of the world that are doing most of the intermediation and the other people are on the receiver end of it. So that's the message from this table. And uh, yeah, so in the final 15 minutes, I guess, yeah, we, let's have some discussion about uh, the last September uh, repo spike. Uh, and maybe we can have a little bit more discussion about the ongoing uh, dollar funding shortage as a result of the COVID crisis. So what happened last September uh, is that if you remember uh, from the news, uh, the repo market went quite wild. Um, so um, for instance, uh, we discussed on September 16th, right? There was a large TGA day uh, in the afternoon of the 16th. The repo rate, rate creeped up to about, I think, a three, uh, 4%. Uh, 
uh, the repo market closed overnight, and the next day uh, the market opened, uh, the repo rate actually reached once too close to 10 percent. Uh, the Fed reestablished additional uh, facility, uh, the repo lending facility, and uh, that uh, calmed down the market. Um, so what you may have missed is there was also a very similar uh, type of tension in the FX swap market that is showing this figure, which we're plotting the intraday uh, fluctuation in the uh, implied dollar uh, funding rate in the FX swap markets, the, the, the bid and offer rate. Uh, so you can see that they increase with the repo rate in lockstep. Okay, so this is good evidence suggesting that these two markets are indeed very synergistic. Um, okay, so, so what we do for this episode is uh, remember all the analysis that we have done so far, we basically use the sample up to this uh, special event. So we use the sample from December 2015 all the way to uh, August uh, 2019. Uh, so we can actually estimate what is a normal response uh, in, resp in response to an 83 uh, billion dollar uh, TGA fluctuation. And then we compare that predicted or based on our regressions, normal response with the actual response of US GSIBs on that day, just to see if the US GSIBs are part of the problem. So that's the motivation for the slides and for this empirical exercise. Uh, so interestingly, what we find is that the US GSIP's response is actually largely in line with the predicted response uh, for this amount of TGA change. So what we are plotting here, for instance, is uh, this is the actual reserve balances, uh, which was drained by a little over 20 billion by US GSIBs on September 16th. Uh, and, and compared to the actual, as uh, compared to the predicted uh, mid uh, predictor um, point estimate about uh, minus 15 billion. So it's largely in line in terms of the amount of reserve draining. And the other variable, repo lending, repo borrowing, net repo lending, FX swap lending, deposit and treasury holdings, so there is actually, to our surprise, isn't much like unusual uh, if you just take the US GSIP's balance sheet on September 16th. So by the way, we discussed there was a rate increase on the 16th, but the biggest rate spike actually happened on the 17th. The reason we chose to use um, data on the 16th is because uh, the Fed actually reestablished repo facility on the 17th. Uh, so our end of day balance sheet information would already incorporate central bank reaction. Uh, so therefore we decide to uh, focus on the 16th uh, in order to not to let the Fed action um, uh, interfere with our interpretation, okay? However, uh, we do find some evidence of unusual uh, things uh, not coming from US GSIBs, uh, but coming from foreign banks. Uh, so what we did here is remember we had those daily reserve balances of foreign banks. Uh, so therefore we can actually do the predicted versus actual um, comparison for foreign banks, just for their reserve balances. What we see here, uh, so US banks reserve draining is largely in line with, their, with our prediction, but foreign banks significantly under drained their reserves, right? So their reserve draining was about uh, 10 billion on that day versus the predicted uh, draining about uh, 30 billion. So, so this is some evidence, uh, some likely evidence suggesting, um, so the bottleneck of the system could be actually uh, the foreign banks who didn't have enough drainable reserves on that day, didn't do enough intermediation. Uh, so the likely spike uh, could be, um, could be um, in part um, due to foreign banks' lack of intermediation and the other US banks' behavior completely in line with our prediction, all right? So what happened afterwards? Uh, what happened afterwards is that the Fed reestablished, uh, so many things happened afterwards. Uh, so the immediate thing that happened after September 16th is that the Fed reintroduced the repo facility, uh, which gives additional ways to borrow dollars to the broker dealer uh, of these large banks. Um, and it was actively used. So what we are plotting here is our six GSIBs take up at the Fed uh, repo facility uh, since September 16th. And in red here, uh, so uh, they make up about, I think one third uh, of the overall repo borrowing from the Fed, uh, roughly speaking. And what's interesting here is you see that initial stage, there was active take up, 
around year end, uh, 2020 year end are typically very difficult funding conditions for regulatory reporting reasons. For instance, we discussed uh, there was active usage around uh, over $100 billion. And in March 2020, under this COVID dollar funding crunch, we also get another active draw in the Fed uh, repo facility. Um, what's even more interesting, not just this time variation are in line with what you would expect, basically Fed facility is a backstop when the market condition gets difficult. There's also significant amount of substitutability between borrowing additional from Fed versus borrowing internally from the commercial banks uh, out of reserve draining. So what this is saying is that the reserve-based intermediation and official uh, borrowing from Fed seems to be substitutes. Um, so what is this blue line again? This is the net internal borrowing um, between uh, from the so that net internal borrowing done by the broker dealers from the commercial bank or uh, of the same bank holding company, and we've always been using this uh, blue line as a proxy for the amount of reserve training activities and. Uh, they are very much inversely related to the amount of borrowing that these banks are, be do, are doing from the Fed. Okay, so I guess that's roughly 15 minutes. Uh, just to recap and look forward to more uh, discussions afterwards. Um, so I think the key lesson emerged from this study is maintaining ample amount of reserve is important to facilitate liquidity provision. So from a monetary policy perspective, if we're thinking about how should we think about the difference between interest rate policy and balance sheet policy? This is the study that we would say from the plumbing perspective, we have argument in favor of balance sheet policy in the sense of maintaining ample amount of reserve, running a large balance sheet because the interest rate policy is not going to come up with that additional benefits of facilitating a liquidity provision. And one step further, uh, so maintaining the level is important, going back to Hano's first clarify question, but also uh, understanding better the internal dynamics within these organizations in terms of intro transfer uh, between the broker dealers and non-broker dealer is crucial. Uh, so this speaks to the synergy between traditional banking and shadow banking and, and uh, any frictions that prevent this type of internal transfer uh, is also going to act as a constraint to our dollar funding market. So I will just end here. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Hanno again for uh, his discussion. Okay, Wenchen, if you could uh, stop, stop sharing, sharing then I'll, okay, great, thank you. Uh, okay. All right, um, so let me let me start by, uh, by complimenting uh, Wenjin and Gordon and Ricardo on, on, on what I really think is a, is a fascinating uh, deep dive into the plumbing of the, the international financial system. Wenjin made, made it look easy, but, but this really requires uh, an enormous amount of data work. And I, I think we've learned quite a bit, right? We've learned that these, these GSEPs seem to be playing a crucial role in intermediating uh, these dollar shortages and by, by draining excess reserves at, at the Fed and then using FX swap and repo uh, channeling these to uh, uh, wherever the dollar shortage is. Um, I was hoping that in our discussion uh, after we could talk a bit more uh, perhaps about uh, the role of the central bank here. Uh, there's, there's some interesting recent work uh, by Ricardo Reese and his co-author for example and on the importance of central bank uh, FX swap lines. And uh, in fact, in um, uh, the response to the recent COVID crisis, the Fed actually uh, expanded its swap lines by adding, I think, about nine countries. Um, and, and so I think it'd be interesting to talk a little bit about the role of these central bank swap lines because they also seem quantitatively important uh, in, in intermediating these shortages and, and certainly have been um, in response to to the COVID crisis. So what I think, uh, what I wanted to do uh, to sort of uh, kick off our, our discussion is sort of pose a couple of um, questions um, for the authors and for the audience. And, and so the first one, uh, in some sense, um, it, we've already talked about a little bit, right? So yes, the, the Fed was shrinking its balance sheet in 2019, uh, but it was still at 3.8 trillion, which um, as I pointed out in my uh, first question was, was sort of um, 
in a broader historical perspective, still qu quite large, more than four times uh, the level of the uh, pre-2008 Fed balance sheet. Uh, and so it seems like um, there's uh, something not quite right with the distribution of reserves across these banks. Uh, and Wenjin talked already a little bit about why that might be. Regulation seems to play a key role. Um, and there's also some, some recent work by my colleague Daryl Duffy with Adam Copeland at the New York Fed and David Jang, who's a PhD student here, that, that, that is sort of looking closely at, at this, this very question, which I think is, is an important one. Um, coming back to the Fed, I think a natural question to ask oneself is, is uh, especially in relation to these permanent swap lines uh, that the Fed has, has instituted. And as I said, it's added uh, to the already existing uh, swap lines for six countries, another nine, um, is the Fed eff effectively now the world's central bank? Um, and is that desirable? Um, and, and in particular, what I would worry about there is that um, there, there seems to be perhaps a moral hazard problem. We've talked a little bit about the fact that the way the international financial system works now with this huge role for the dollar is, is there some instability uh, that is sort of intrinsic to the way it works. And perhaps market participants have engineered a dollar funding system that is vulnerable to, sh to these types of shortages, partly because they expect um, the Fed to step in. Another question I had was, and, and uh, Ricardo Reese uh, talks a little bit about this in his paper, um, on swap lines is, do these swap lines put an upper bound on, on CIP deviations? And why didn't this sort of um, um, kick in uh, in the episode in 2019 that Wenjin was looking at? I, I think that there were these sort of standing swap lines, perhaps they weren't used. Maybe we could talk a little bit about that. Um, related question, of course, is, is and this is, um, again, about the Fed. What is the right size of the Fed balance sheet? It, is part of the reason the Fed now needs a much larger balance sheet because it's effectively uh, become the, the world's central bank and it has to intermediate these dollar shortages around the world. Um, GSIPs, the role of GSIP during COVID. Um, between March and May of, of 2020, I think um, FX swaps from the Fed reached a level of about 400 billion, which seems quite large. What was happening with these GSIPs? Were they not uh, sort of doing what we expected of them in, in terms of intermediating these, these dollar shortages? Uh, is another question that uh, came to mind when I was, when I was thinking about this. Um, and then, um, and these are sort of more normative uh, questions that are a little bit about outside of the scope of, uh, of the paper, but I think it'd be interesting to think about them. Perhaps it, this work also shows that maybe we ought to think about having sort of a more balanced architecture for the international financial system. We have the system that sort of induces excessive dollar leverage, uh, currency mismatch around the world. Uh, the U.S. Is, is, is sort of playing this game where they keep uh, trying to find new ways to produce dollar safe assets. Uh, uh, how long can we keep doing that? Um, perhaps we ought to think about moving uh, to a more balanced, uh, less dollar centric system where these, these dollar shortages uh, would be less, less acute. Um, and, and the last thing I wanted to, uh, to say here is sort of provide a, a broader historical perspective. Um, the UK used to be in the US position prior to World War I. And in fact, if you uh, were to use historical data uh, to compute the US-UK treasury basis, um, I've done this here using uh, the uh, data provided by uh, Jorda, Shalaric, and Taylor. Uh, what you see is that there, there was indeed a, a fairly large uh, US-UK treasury basis. Uh, US interest rates were were about 2% higher than UK interest rates uh, before World War I. And during World War I, the UK had to issue massive amounts of debt. And after that, it seems like uh, this treasury basis uh, disappeared. And, and the UK obviously lost its role as, as the provider of, of the dominant currency in the world's safe assets. So maybe um, that's a good historical uh, perspective to keep in mind. I'll end my remarks here. 
and and hopefully we can we can sort of start a discussion based on some of these uh, remarks that I that I made. Great, uh, thank you very much, Hanna, for great uh, moderation and uh, and discussion. Uh, I'm going to let uh, Wenjin uh, respond, uh, uh, but before that, I just want to remind people that if you do want to ra have uh, uh, if you have a question, please use the raise hand feature now, and then we'll get to you in the in the general audience Q and A. Okay, so Wenjin, if you want to respond, uh, please go ahead. Great, thanks so much. I'll say a few words, and maybe uh, Gordon and Ricardo also have some additional thoughts as well. Yeah, thanks so much, Hanno, for the insightful comments. Like definitely, all the points you have raised uh, are very important and worth thinking more. I guess I can comment a little bit on the on the swap line aspect, right? You're absolutely right. I mean, I think the peak take up of the dollar swap line during COVID is like another 400 billion. That's a very large number, like especially given the balance sheet of the Fed has already exploded, right? We also have the repo facility on top of that. In fact, we have additional facility uh, for foreign official sector also in terms of dollar repo, uh, but still there is very active swap line usage. And that was, I think, important to also get the whole money market in order uh, back in March. Uh, I think through the lens of our six US GSIPs, they're not very active. We don't show data here, but I think just broadly, they're not very active in taking up swap lines. I think for obvious reasons, because they have very deep dollar deposit base and uh, they have other means like in terms of getting access to repo funding in the wholesale markets. Um, but there are other players, right? There are other players who do not, are not in their advantageous positions. So largely I think foreign banks and uh, probably smaller, um, second tier foreign banks are still in desperate need of dollar funding and there are the non-banks um, that are also very important in this round of dollar cash demand. So thinking about institutional investors facing Europe and Japan uh, holding a 10-year U.S. Treasury need to rolling hedge their FX exposure, essentially demanding three months funding on a constant basis. And therefore, this time around, you see a significant uptake of the, dollar, of the dollar swap line at term, so three months tenor point as opposed to the overnight. So which speaks to the non-banks demand is also very important. Um, so the question is whether the GSIPs of the world are going to be sufficient to intermediate that non-banks cash demand. And the question if it's no, especially during a type of global pandemic, then the Fed need to still actively step in to be the essentially the dealer of last resort also in the FX swap market. Great. Okay, thank you, Wenxin. Um, let me start with uh, a first question from the general Q&A. Uh, let's go to Ken Ahern from uh, USC. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Um, so it seems like um, in very broad terms, what you're showing is banks have two sources of financing, internal or external. And I was kind of trying to understand if you had no regulation at all, would you expect that the banks would prefer to use their internal funds from the cash holdings or external funds um, from a loan, an external loan? I would think if there's an information asymmetry and adverse selection cost, they'd always want to use the internal funds first. Um, absent any regulation. So your data though shows it seems that the, the cash holdings, the internal financing is only used in extreme cases or maybe at the quarter ends. So I was wondering if you could kind of give some color to, to what I'm thinking about. What, what is your view on, in big picture terms, the information cost or the reasons why they'd want to use one source of financing over the other? Yeah, great, thanks so much. Um, that's an excellent question. I guess one way to think about it is to think about the pre-GFC and the post-GFC regime, right? I mean, the pre-GFC regime, we didn't have quantitative easing, right? There was the total amount of excess reserve balances in the system is actually zero, and banks didn't earn interest on reserves. So in other words, I mean, in the old days, right, we didn't have any extra cash for the whole system uh, to support uh, additional surge, for instance, in dollar funding demand. Yeah, at each bank's level, of course, some banks are a little long, other banks are a little short. That's why we had a very in active interbank market. Um, so what this research is showing is in a very different environment, right? And post-crisis, like the whole system is flooded with a huge amount of in the cash, right? So you can think about label those as internal cash because everybody seems to be getting a lot of those. And if you have a big surge in the dollar funding demand, say think about big TGA shock, 
then the question is how do you allocate those extra cash versus doing additional maybe the pre GFC like interbank type of borrowing. Second, if anything, maybe just beyond the usual information at selection type of cost, I think this change in the landscape is probably more of first order importance. Okay, thanks. Great. Um, next up, we have uh, Mayar Kargar from University of Illinois at uh, Urbana-Champaign. Mayar. Hi, uh, thank you. So, can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Good. Uh, thank you so much for the very interesting talk. Uh, so my question was uh, pretty much kind of mainly answered by Ricardo and Gordon in the chat. So my question was, uh, you mentioned that uh, banks are mainly, especially that leverage constrained banks are uh, going to reserve draining to finance this short uh, term dollar funding. So then the question I have is what other types of uh, regulations that exist within the, uh, for the internal capital markets, specifically regulation W, or living well, would they potentially limit the size that uh, this internal capital market lending could happen between the depository institution to the broker dealer that actually does this uh, FX uh, swap market lending? If you can like comment on uh, what impact is these type of regulations uh, within the bank holding company or other things that limit the size and potentially have impact on this uh, spikes in the, in the short term funding market. Yeah, great. I, I didn't read the Gordon and Ricardo's answer, so this is the independent answer, but I'm sure they might be correlated. Um, so I think, yeah, so in terms of regulation, the limit, the size of balance sheet, we discussed the Basel three leverage ratio, we discuss, discussed the size component of the GCIP capital surcharge. So those would be the first order important one. And in terms of the stuff that limit the intro firm flows, right, you correctly brought up regulation W, which is precisely designed to limit the flow between the broker dealers and other affiliate entities within the same bank. Uh, but the repo transactions are actually exempt. So internal repo positions are exempt from the flows that's uh, sort of constrained by the reg W. Uh, so therefore, as a result, the stuff that we see in the data is actually most of these intro firm flows are booked in terms of repo. Um, but yeah, the other things that you brought up in terms of resolution planning and living will, so I briefly cover those. Um, yeah, so I think those are those are more material um, in the sense like banks on an ongoing basis need to plan ahead in terms of what scenarios they will face right, in the case of resolution. And, uh, and those would be, there will be incentives that incentivize them to say hoard liquidity within a particular uh, subsidiary or more broadly hoard liquidities within the US. That's where their material business operations are. Um, yeah. Uh, if I may add in uh, one point, which I mentioned on the chat, which is the also uh, one particular limit to how much reserve could be used um, is uh, the intraday nature of reserves. And banks need to maintain a certain level of uh, intraday uh, liquidity that is ahead of set aside a certain buffer. So that's another reason that of all the excess reserve, uh, only part of it could be used for intermediation and the rest of it had to be either set aside for you know, resolution planning, as we mentioned, um, or for intraday cash flows, which could be um, up to 50%, uh, according to JP Morgan. Right, right, right. This brought that famous Jamie Dimon uh, Q3 earnings call transcript um, in response to a question. He explicitly said, now we have 120 billion reserves, end of day, but intraday, the lowest is 60. The question is whether we're comfortable with going down more than 50, 60. If the answer is no, then we cannot do more. Uh, so that directly speaks to what Gordon just said. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Mayar. Um, I wanna take up a question from the chat here from uh, Jaideep uh, Oberoi from the University of Kent. Uh, Jaideep, go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks. I, uh, my question was uh, sort of answered and uh, from, from the presentation as uh, and from uh, and by Gordon, but uh, just in case you, you would like to add something. Uh, essentially, what I understood was that the the, the re repo rates go up quite a lot around the quarter end dates, and so uh, uh, this is this is probably inducing somehow the the banks to uh, switch to intra bank holding company lending, uh, and. Uh, this is kind of confirmed by the fact that you, when you did the other exercise, 
when the uh, the inter bank holding company lending actually fell on quarter end dates uh, rather than rising so uh, uh, is there is there some way of figuring out like how sensitive uh, these changes are and when is it that uh, the the, re, uh, the repo rates go up much more so so uh, i don't know if you want to if there's anything more to add in terms of covering uh, mm. that 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 was my question yeah yeah great question yeah i think you're absolutely right i think one interpretation of our results why banks didn't borrow more on these difficult days is precisely because it's more expensive right i mean the repo rate did go up i think there's a lot of complexity in the just the market structure of the repo market right there are many different repo rates but i think they all go up and the spreads between them also went up on these difficult days um so, so to address your question, I mean, the short answer is that we haven't done anything super rigorous in backing out that elasticity, um, but that requires getting a more granular instrument to do it. Uh, but that will certainly be something of extreme like value if we are able to do it. So Thank more, you. more broadly thinking about how much arbitrage capital we need to actually wipe out these type of textbook, no arbitrage failure. Yeah. Great. Um, so um, last comment today, we want to circle back to one of the co-authors who wanted to talk a little bit about the Hanos points. So uh, Gordon, if you wanted to take it away. Sure. Go ahead. I know. Thanks so much for the discussion. Uh, you raised a number of very important uh, and broader questions. Um, so in response to your, these are just my thoughts, uh, my view not reflecting the Fed. Uh, you mentioned whether the Fed is acting as a world central bank and whether it creates moral hazard. I think uh, the way to look at the swap lines in which the Fed is lending to the rest of the other central banks is that it's a dollar uh, loan. And uh, if we, from previous studies, we know that uh, foreign banks play a large role in the dollar lending market. So that's uh, Ivan Schinner, Sharpstein, and Stein. And so a large part, what we see in March is large part of the swap line usage uh, went towards foreign banks that also had US operations and also lend out uh, money through uh, credit uh, credit land draws by U.S. firms. And other part of it, adding to what Winshin mentioned, is uh, the usage of uh, dollar funding by uh, non-banks. Um, and the swap line also played an important role in providing uh, uh, foreign investors with the dollar fund necessary to uh, essentially hedge their currency position. So this is related to a recent paper I wrote with uh, Tony Zhang on the currency hedging role um, that and how it interacts with swap line usage. Uh, so to sum up, I think for the, yes, US banks, are, the Fed is providing quite a bit of lending to uh, other foreign central banks, but those funding ultimately go back to uh, US uh, borrowers in either through the banking channel or the non-bank channel. And you also mentioned about whether the swap line facility creates a hard ceiling. So in the experience that we had uh, looking very closely and being involved um, at the uh, at the Fed on the swap line during March, what we see is even though we lower the swap line from OIS plus 50 basis points to OIS plus 25 basis points, for a couple of weeks, uh, the, sw the swaps that were trading in the public market was still at OS plus 200. Um, that signals to us that there's significant amount of intermediation frictions. That is, for instance, a Japanese bank, say Numera, can borrow at the BOJ and can online to their uh, domestic institutions, but they're unwilling to do so even at OS plus 25 basis points I see. Uh, because of various frictions in the market. And this is why we think it is important to study the frictions and intermediation channels that we observe here. Um, yeah. And lastly, Absolutely. relating to your question about the right size of the Fed balance sheet, uh, you know, our study kind of points to that uh, going into the future uh, with this reserve-based intermediation, we had to consider uh, Fed balance sheet size much more carefully, uh, in addition to the usage of reserves that continue to uh, be important in this period with large TGA swings. But also, if you notice in one of the charts I mentioned, show, there is a gradual increase in currency in circulation that is just cash. And that also just naturally increases the Fed balance sheet without you know, any other frictions. So thanks again for the uh, discussion. Thanks for clarifying, Gordon. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah.
Okay, thank you everybody for participating. We are officially out of time. Uh, so thanks to Wenjin for a great presentation. Thanks to Hanno for great moderation and discussion. Uh, I hope you all will tune in next week. Next week, we got Matteo Gomez from uh, Colombia visiting UCLA, uh, presenting his paper on uh, a Q theory model of inequality. And we're gonna have Nicola Garliano from uh, Haas Berkeley as our moderator and discussant. So until then, I wish you a great weekend and a great week. Great, thank you so much.